Um, my name is Howard Brown, and I'm here from the University of Niigata Prefecture. I'm very happy to be here. This is my third year at Lakeland. Hopefully third of many in the future. Mm -hmm. So you're not allowed to stop finding this. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the internationalization of higher education in Japan, and especially taking a historical perspective on the process of innovation. I've been working in internationalization programs for about nine years now, and I've been studying specifically English medium instruction programs for most of that time. But lately, I've been trying to take a step back and look not just at the programs I've been involved with or the programs I've been studying, but I'm trying to get a broader sense of how the process of innovation has worked. And I've been looking at one particular historical perspective in an attempt to understand that. Um, when I talk about internationalization initiatives, as I said, I mostly study um, English medium instruction programs and English taught programs around Japan. But there are also various and sundry efforts and initiatives under the banner of Global Jinzai. Um, there are overseas partnerships and there are a lot of study abroad programs, both for outgoing Japanese students and for incoming um, international students. And for the purposes of today's discussion, I'm grouping all of these under the banner of internationalization initiatives. And as stakeholders in these initiatives, I think a lot of us are very excited about the potential. There's a lot of potential for benefiting the students, a lot of potential for benefiting the institutions we work at, and a lot of potential for us personally and professionally to accomplish goals and really develop ourselves through these programs. But I think we've all experienced some frustration to some extent by this process. What are we frustrated about? Well, the big three that I've found are institutional inertia. Um, it's a very frustrating thing to deal with when you're trying to move through a process of innovation. Disjuncture among colleagues who may feel threatened or marginalized by changes and in innovations. And vague and unclear priorities. Um, instructions coming down from the ministry, institutional initiatives, department level initiatives, program level initiatives are in many cases unaligned or vague, unclear. We have these frustrations. But what I'd like to say today, and what I think it's important to keep in mind, is that none of these frustrations and none of this excitement about the potential is new. We've been here before. Um, I would like to recommend, oh, I don't think we can read that, but anyway, it'll be on the reference list later. Um, I would like to recommend uh, a book that I think everyone should read. Everyone involved in internationalization should definitely read the book called Roadblocks on the Information Highway. It came out in 2003, and it's all about IT initiatives in Japanese universities in the 1990s. Um, edited by Jane Batchnik. Um, and when I read this book, I was shocked, actually. Because if you take out the word IT, and you copy and paste in the word internationalization, <laughs> it could have been written last week. Okay? Um, it is the same story. So we've been here before. When you look through what happened in the 1990s, not only from Bachnick's book, but from a lot of things published between, say, 2000 and 2010, when people look back at the whole process of innovation, we saw an education sector in crisis, a rhetoric of crisis about undergraduate education. Um, universities tasked with reinventing youth and creating a new kind of human resources. Um, universities and programs focused on implementation rather than integration. Um, programs lacking in specialist support and decision making driven by short term needs at the expense of long term planning. So I'm going to talk about each of these points and I just want to draw out the parallels between what we saw in the 90s and what we see now. Because I think if we understand the full process of what happened in the 1990s, it can give us a better sense of the process that we're in the middle of right now. Um, in terms of a sense of crisis, the IT revolution happened at a very interesting time in Japan. It was the end of the bubble. There was a lot of uncertainty about the future. There was a fear of falling behind other countries. And there was a sense that Japan was lacking appropriate human resources because the economy was changing 
The world was globalizing and internationalizing at a very rapid rate, and Japan was seen as not keeping up. And there was a very strong rhetoric of crisis surrounding the needs of undergraduate, especially undergraduate education at that time. And it was all connected to IT. Well, I'm not sure exactly the definition of crisis, but I'm not sure a crisis is allowed to last 35 years. But this one has. Um, the rhetoric of crisis has been ongoing since about 1988. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can't have a crisis that's that long, but they've tried. Um, the current rhetoric of crisis, the current discourse of crisis, is based on a need to react to globalization. Universities need to internationalize, not to become a member of the world community, but to react to something that's outside Japan. Um, we have to respond to the fact that Japan's competitiveness, competitiveness rankings in terms of business are eroding, and Japan is no longer a business leader in the world. Um, the so-called inward-looking youth problem, which I would argue is the young people of Japan are not as inward-looking as the government and business leaders would have you believe, but that's a discussion for a, a different presentation. Uh, and a declining labor force. And I think when you look at the rhetoric of why we needed IT in the 90s and why we need internationalization now, the discourse is very similar. We're looking at all the same drivers, all the same motivators. Um, also, when we looked at what happened in the 1990s with IT, they were not just putting computers in rooms. Well, in the end, that's what actually happened. But that's not what they said they were trying to do. <laughs> they were trying to create a new kind of human resource. They were trying to create university graduates with high-tech skills, some with specialist IT knowledge, but also, even among generalists, they wanted computer literacy, and they wanted uh, an IT-savvy workforce among the younger generation. They also wanted to produce a new kind of individual entrepreneurial spirit based on what we might think of as the Silicon Valley model. Um, and that was very clearly one of the things that all of these IT initiatives in higher education was supposed to do, was to produce a new generation of young entrepreneurs. Also, and I, I've noticed a real similarity here, the IT initiatives of the 1990s were intended to and pushed towards creating young people with originality, individuality, creativity, initiative, and leadership. Have we seen those words before? <laughs> yeah. That is Global Jinzai. Okay? Global Jinzai is not focused on the IT skills, obviously. It's mostly focused on foreign language skills, which is often trivialized just to mean a good TOEIC score. Um, but who are we looking for? We're looking for flexibility, independence, creativity, leadership. And this, this leads me to believe that whatever they were doing in the 90s didn't work. Because if we had created a whole new generation of university graduates with these characteristics in the 1990s, we wouldn't be still trying to make them today. We wouldn't still be looking for these people. So I really don't think that the goal of internationalization has changed all that much from what was happening in the 1990s. Another factor is a priority on implementation and a real lack of follow through. Like you were talking about with study abroad programs, the follow through was very lacking in IT in the 1990s. There was a focus on logistical issues, numerical targets were the prime driver. Mm -hmm. How many computers do you have on campus? What's the ratio of undergraduate students per PC available? Um, what's the connection speed? What bandwidth do you have? All of those were prime drivers of IT initiatives. The influence on pedagogy and the learning experience of the students were secondary concerns. Or, Bachnick actually argues that that whole idea of the influence of IT on pedagogy was completely absent from the discussion. It wasn't even a secondary concern, it was just gone. And so what did we end up with? We ended up with a gap between the availability of the technology on campus and how it was actually being used in class. And even today, 25 years later, we don't really see a lot of good integration between learning and IT in higher education in Japan. Um, a lot of that was because of the sources of funding. Funding was available for things like logistics, for software, for equipment, for installation. 
Training for faculty, not so much. Redesign of pedagogy, not so much. Funding was not available for those kinds of things. In internationalization, we're seeing a very similar pattern. First off, there's a great deal of ad hoc implementation. Um, the number that I found in my own research last year was something like 48% of universities that I surveyed told me that their EMI programs were ad hoc. And that was people that were willing to tell me they were ad hoc. And that was 48%. I suspect that the actual number was much higher. Um, numerical targets are still being focused on. How many EMI classes you have is a key indicator. How many international faculty members do you have is a key indicator. What they're actually doing on campus, what impact they have on the student's learning and so on, a very, very secondary consideration. The numbers are driving everything. And one thing I've noticed in implementation, which I think is another parallel with IT, is the idea that implementation itself is the goal. The point of creating an internationalization program, be it a study abroad program, be it a Google Jinzai program, be it an English medium instruction program, the goal is the program. And once the program is up and running, the goal has been accomplished. The follow through, evaluating learning experiences, none of that is really important. The goal is to have the program. Another parallel that I've seen is a lack of support um, during the IT implementations, we had a lot of universities with generalist administrators who were assigned to the IT initiatives who had authority over the implementation, but no actual specialized skills uh, and no real computer literacy. Where specialist support was available, it was temporary or part-time, which meant that they didn't have a voice in decision making. So the, the skilled people were not part of the decision-making process for the implementation. And the initiatives ended up relying on largely self-taught faculty members who were volunteers and who were committed to the program um, rather than an official administrative support throughout the university. Um, all of my other slides had two columns, one for IT, one for internalization. It's just the same. Um, nothing has changed since the 1990s, so I didn't bother to make another call. Um, another parallel I see um, is the idea that universities are, well these programs within universities are fighting what Brumby calls the tyranny of tradition. Um, when he looked at IT programs, he saw these universities were trying to foster specialization and trying to foster creativity, originality, independence among students. But university structures rewarded generalists. And the idea of being a specialist, the idea of being creative, being an individual, there was a nice rhetoric surrounding that idea, but actual structures and procedures on campus did not reward that. In fact, impeded it in many cases. Um, Batchnik referred to this as swimming upstream. When we see this in internationalization, we see the same sense of swimming upstream in terms of definitions of global jinzai. We're trying to foster global understanding among students, but not too much global mindedness. Okay? Um, it's always been very interesting for me that the core of the definition of global jinzai is always a strong definition or a strong identity as a Japanese, mm -hmm. is always at the core of a global jinzai definition. And I think that's part of this idea of swimming upstream, that we're, we're moving towards a certain international mindedness, but there is a tyranny of tradition that's putting a bit of pushback on that. Uh, another aspect of the tyranny of tradition is in terms of administrative structures within the university. Um, during the IT initiatives, real implementation of IT called for um, changes in organizational structure, um, changes in institutional identity, and big changes in classroom pedagogy. And none of that happened. And none of that happened because it conflicted with established institutional identity. And so we got a lot of resistance, we got a lot of disjuncture, we had a lot of people threatened by these initiatives. Looking at internationalization, we see a very similar issue. We see university administrative structures are fundamentally averse to real internationalization. 
Um, institutional identity, a lack of precedent. Well, we haven't done it before, therefore we can't do it. Um, disjuncture, again, and some objections based on identity issues and nationalism. These are making up a tyranny of tradition that our internationalization efforts are struggling to overcome. So what we end up with is, I would argue, a superficial implementation, uh, a layer of paint as opposed to a full remodel of the house. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, so where did these problems come from? Well, if we stick with Batchnik's roadblock metaphor, I think in the 1990s, when IT was coming in, universities reached a fork in the road, and they made a choice. And they made what, at the time, probably was a rational choice. But with the benefit of hindsight, we can see why they had trouble. They came to a fork in the road. Down one path, we could work to make IT a central part of higher education in Japan. We could make the deep and possibly identity threatening changes that were necessary. We could change institutional culture. We could change how universities were administered. We could change our approach to pedagogy. And we could have a long term coherent IT strategy for education in Japan. Or we could take an easier path. We could focus on superficial technical issues. We could have um, numerical targets driving our decision making. We could make decisions on a department by department basis because campus wide consensus is just too hard to achieve. Um, and we could have short term reactive planning. A three year funding cycle, great. We'll have a three year planning cycle as well. Um, looking back at what happened in the 1990s, it's pretty obvious that universities chose the easier path. Universities moved down the short-term and reactive <coughs> path. And what did we end up with? Well, we ended up with IT being implemented on a case-by-case -case basis as a reaction to numerical targets and really lacking in a long-term vision or coherent strategy on a nationwide level, but also even institutionally inside some universities, especially the larger universities, there was no campus-wide coherent strategy for IT. And we ended up with a superficial implementation. And even now, 25 years later, 30 years later, we still see communications technology, information management, online distance education. The whole IT experience is relatively underdeveloped in Japanese universities. So what does that mean for us? Well, I think we're at the same fork in the road. And when I'm in a bad mood, when I'm feeling pessimistic, I fear that we're going down the short-term path. And I fear that we are on the path to short-term reactive decision-making, superficial implementation, and a lack of coherent strategy. But when I'm in a good mood, when I'm feeling optimistic, I remember that in the past 10 years, there's been a 50% increase in the number of universities teaching in English. There's been a huge increase in the number of universities with international partnerships. One in three English taught programs in Japan is less than 10 years old. One in three English medium instruction classrooms in Japan is less than 10 years old. So we are not too far down the easy path. We are still fresh enough, we are still young enough that English medium instruction, my own research topic, and internationalization as a whole, the wider issue, universities can still change the path. We can still move to arguably the harder path, but we can make long-term decisions. We can look back at the experience of IT programs in the 90s, and we can learn from what happened then. And I think we still have potential to make a long-term decision and make a long-term commitment to internationalization so that we don't just implement internationalization efforts, we actually integrate them into what our universities are doing. 
Um, that's all I have for now, and I've been giving the one minute left. So I'm going to use my last minute for some shameless self-promotion. <laughs> uh, coming soon for Multilingual Matters, English Medium Instruction in Japanese Higher Education, Policy Challenges and Outcomes, edited by Annette Bradford and Chris um, Owen, Howard Browns. <laughs> coming this winter for Multilingual Matters. Get it online now. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a handout, which is mostly just a reference list.